I hope everyone is having a good Wednesday. Um, my name is Annalise and I'm Hydroview's head of policy. So basically I uh, keep track of everything that's going on in the world of water. So one of the things that we've been getting a lot of questions on through our support channel um, is just about well water. So that's what today is going to kind of go over. Just just answer some questions um, about well water. Um, so yeah, I guess we can dive right in um, and just talk about some of the most common contaminants that are typically found in well water. Um, so well water is a little bit unique in that a lot of the contamination comes from natural sources, um, which is different compared to uh, municipal tap water. Um, and of course, well water is still susceptible to chemical pollution and things like that, um, but it's typically natural uh, contaminants. So we'll kind of go over those now. Um, so first is arsenic, which you're probably the most familiar of in this kind of laundry list. Um, and I'll go into detail about arsenic in a minute, um, but it is a naturally occurring heavy metal that is found in bedrock and as that bedrock uh, weathers over time it then leaches into groundwater um, and the next up is uranium um, so this is kind of like a scary sounding contaminant um, but it's a naturally occurring radionuclide um, and the current epa maximum contaminant level is 30 parts per billion and i wanted to put that out there uh, because we recently had a customer that had uranium levels of 235 parts per billion. So this is seven times over the maximum contaminant level. Um, luckily our filters brought it down to undetectable, but I just wanted to say that so that you're, you're all aware of the range and how high uranium can get uh, depending on where you live in the country. This protect, particular customer was in Maine. Um, so it really does depend on uh, your geographical location and what's actually in the bedrock um, of your home. So next up is PFAS, which we've talked a lot about on um, this, inst or not this Instagram Live, but on our previous Instagram Lives. So if you want to go check those out and kind of get a more broad overview of PFAS, definitely do that. Um, people are waving hello. <laughs> um, so PFAS is a category of emerging contaminants um, and they are known to cause various health effects, increased risk of cancer, um, reproductive issues, lowered, lowered immune function. Um, so it's a really nasty contaminant that is still being studied and it's not regulated by EPA. Uh, so PFAS are very persistent in the environment and that means that they can travel long distances through groundwater, through soil, without breaking down. Um, and that's what makes them particularly harmful. So one of the best case studies is actually in uh, North Carolina. The Comores plant um, was producing, or still is producing PFAS contaminants, and uh, they actually are required to test wells in the surrounding area. So what that means is that they know that PFAS is traveling through groundwater, through soil, and entering these people's private wells. Um, so they are only required to test nine miles, a nine mile radius, um, but in that nine mile radius, PFAS is being detected at, at extremely high levels. So yeah, um, next up is lead. So. People may be a little bit surprised by this, but groundwater can be extremely corrosive. Um, and corrosive water can cause lead to leach from pipes and plumbing and fixtures um, and enter your groundwater. So USGS, which is a really, really great resource, and our production team uses USGS on a daily basis uh, when building our filters. They have this really great map that shows where corrosive groundwater is uh, common in the United States and it's pretty surprising. It's it's basically the whole East Coast has really corrosive groundwater uh, and then the southwestern United States. So I'll add a link to that website in our uh, Instagram bio when this is done. Next up is nitrates. 
So nitrates are associated with fertilizer runoff and farming. So they're not a huge problem across the entire United States. Um, but if you are living uh, in a home on a private well near farmland, this might be something that you want to be uh, a little bit concerned with. Nitrates are interesting because they really only affect uh, babies and this phenomenon caused, uh, called baby blue syndrome. And uh, it's not really uh, common anymore. And yeah, people uh, tend to kind of worry about nitrates when it really isn't that big of a problem at this point. And our filters aren't really a great tool for nitrates. You'll want something like a reverse osmosis to remove them. Um, so yeah, and then next up is biologicals. So biological contamination uh, can be common in private wells, um, but it doesn't always necessarily mean that if they're there, it's not an indication of unsafe water. Um, and biological contamination is typically resolved by uh, either shocking the well or some sort of UV filtration. Um, yeah, so let me just look at what our next question is. All right, can contaminants, the concentration of contaminants change with time in well water? So short answer, yes, absolutely. Um, as I was talking about uranium and arsenic, these levels, there's a lot of variability as that bedrock weathers over time. Um, so the levels can change all the time depending on the corrosivity of the, wa of the water um, and where you're located, what your geology is like, things like that. Um, but also the safe level can change over time as well. So like what is actually considered safe in, uh, you know, the 2000s may not be, con be considered safe now. And so the best example of this is the arsenic safe level or um, in the regulatory space we call this the maximum contaminant level or MCL. Um, so this safe level was actually updated in 2001 um, and it was a pretty dramatic <laughs> reduction. So it went from 50 parts per billion was considered safe and then in 2001 10 parts per billion was considered safe for arsenic. Um, so you would actually be surprised how many customers we have that haven't had their wells tested since 2001 or, or earlier when 50 parts per billion was safe. So basically the, you know, their well water went from safe to unsafe overnight without anything actually changing or anything, you know, really required of them. Um, so yeah, so basically the three or the 10 part per, part per billion threshold was actually a compromise. Um, and EPA scientists and public health officials wanted the safe level of arsenic to be three parts per billion. Um, and this is what they believe to be the actual level that you can be exposed and not have any negative health effects. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> they weren't able to justify three parts per billion in a cost-benefit analysis. So basically, politicians were lobbying for something that was feasible, which was 10 parts per billion. And the compromise of 10 parts per billion happened because municipalities are required to disclose if you have over three parts per billion. So if you uh, go to your online to your city's consumer confidence report and if you have arsenic over three parts per billion you'll see this tiny little disclosure that says by the way you know this isn't what we actually considered safe but uh here you go so it's basically they think that writing something on a piece of paper makes it okay um so yeah we take arsenic very very seriously at hydro beef um, and being from Maine, arsenic is a huge problem. We have some of the highest rates of bladder, can bladder cancer in the country, um, which is directly associated with arsenic. So, next. Ooh, this is a good one. So, do private wells need to meet federal regulatory requirements? Um, no. So, 
private wells are and private well owners are entirely on their own for determining the safety of their drinking water. So there's no outside agency telling you or giving you the okay to drink your own water if you're on a private well. So this is completely different than uh, the public municipal, municipal water where you have this outside agency saying you meet all of the uh, requirements or under all of the standards under the Safe Drinking Water Act. So it's really up to the private well owner to determine the safety of their water. Um, okay, so this is a, another really good one. So I got my well water checked when I bought my house. Is this enough? Uh, not necessarily. So like I said, the regulatory limit for arsenic changed in 2001. So if you bought your house before 2001, people think that one well water test uh, check when they buy their house is sufficient enough. It's not necessarily the case. Um, and then also, the kind of initial check that you are given when you purchase your house, typically from uh, the realtor, is uh, sparse to say the least. Like, that test only includes a handful of contaminants um, and it typically doesn't even include lead so it'll include one type of arsenic um, and then some sort of biological and then nitrate presence so it's not really thorough it doesn't really include um, PFAS or any other chemical pollution that might be present in um, well water so it's definitely a good idea to just uh, be aware that when you buy your house, it's good to just check. Um, you can even, you can ask one of our water nerds, of course, we'd be happy to um, look at scientific literature in your geographical area just to kind of see if there's anything um, research related about what's going on in that area. Also, the USGS uh, Corrosivity map is also a really, really good resource, especially if you live in an older home, it might be good to check out. Um, but if you do live on a private well, feel free to um, DM us or send us an email at hello at hydroviv.com. We have a team of scientists that are very eager to answer questions about your well water um, or anything regarding water quality. Also, we uh, are putting this um, audio and other audios in the past onto our podcast which can be found on itunes and it's called water nerds sorry we got a question Work to help for find most accurate testing okay i think you're talking about labs so that's a really really good point i'm going to add in that link tree um a resource from epa that is all of the accredited uh, testing labs. So uh, if you are in a private well and you're looking to have your well tested, make sure that you're using a third-party accredited lab um, just to uh, make sure that you're getting a really thorough view. So what data do you look for to help you find your most accurate testing data? Um, so definitely the contaminants that I listed you'll want to uh, have checked out Unfortunately, water testing can get pretty expensive. Um, so, you know, arsenic is probably the number one priority, especially if you live in the Northeast or Southwestern parts of the United States, um, where arsenic is a, is a really, really big problem. Um, okay, so I think that is pretty much it. Um, again, if you have any other questions, DM us, email us, whatever, however you want to get in contact, we're definitely happy to answer any questions. Um, so, oh, do you rely on third-party data or your own? Um, so, it depends. If you're on a private well, um, you are going to be the only one testing, so then you'll want to rely on your data. In terms of our filter and our removal rates, we have a bunch of third-party test data um, that shows how well our filters are able to remove uh, a huge list of different contaminants. So, 
yeah and if you want to answer, uh, ask any other questions again feel free to dm us so all right thank you for tuning in and i hope everyone has a great wednesday bye